Um, I've only been given 10 minutes, I'll start off so much. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about how much a sport um, changed my life. And before I go further, the sport literally saved my life. When I was a little boy, I grew up in Crystal Palace in South London, and my mum brought me up with my sister. And I had all sort of what I thought was a normal childhood. When I sat down to primary school, People at primary school, young kids, used to tease me like I didn't have a dad. And they used to say, where's your dad? And I went home one day and my mum explained to me that the dad passed away before I was born. And then she explained to me what death was. And I kind of understood from a young age that one day I would be here. Around this sort of time, I developed a fascination with history. And my mum used to get me these uh, booklets out of the uh, news agents called Discovery Booklets. And every month was a different stage in history. And I used to read these books as a young boy, it was about Napoleon, Second World War, First World War, and people were still talking about these men hundreds of years after they were dead. And I didn't know what the word was, but the word was legacy. People remembered them. And around this sort of time, I developed this obsession with British Telecom. And when my mum used to take around anyone's house, my aunties, I used to run around to all the different bedrooms, and everyone had a BT landline. And when we were in the car driving to the house, I would look out the window, and every, there was a BT landline on um, phone box everywhere. And I said to my uncle one day, how much money does British Telecom make? And he said they make billions. And from that moment, when any adult said to me, what are you going to do when you get older? I said, I'm going to know British Telecom and I'm going to be a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> now the reason I'm explaining this story to you is so you get an understanding that when I was little, I was ambitious and I wanted to be successful and I wanted to make something of my life. I didn't want to be a criminal, I just wanted to be successful. When I was eight years old, a man came into my life that completely and utterly shaped what I thought life was about. This man was my mum's ex-husband. He came to my life at eight years old and it transpired that he was one of the most prolific armed robbers in the United Kingdom. He had five acquittals at the Old Bailey. The police tried to shoot him two times. He was a multi-millionaire when he was 21 years old. He came into my life at eight years old because he just finished off serving a 16-year prison sentence for armed robbery. He took me under his wing because he didn't have a son and he would take me out and he would introduce me to all these older men. I was a young boy and had big cars, watches, houses and everything was about money. And as I started getting a little bit older, it transpired and I found out when I watched a film on Channel 3 called Fool's Gold, that my biological uncle, when my dad passed away, his brother committed the biggest time robbery in the world and stole 26 million pounds worth of gold balloon from Heathrow Airport. When I watched that film on ITV, that film changed my life from a kid. I watched it and I honestly feel so embarrassed today to say to you that film inspired me to become a criminal when I become older. I left school at 16 years old. I completely gave my education up. I started truing it because it meant nothing to me. My stepdad believed I'd be safer committing crime with him than I would be people my own age. So I would go out and I would case security vans making deliveries to banks and building societies and pass that information on to all the criminals. I realised I wasn't going to come rich doing that, so I started doing it myself. 18 years old, I get arrested. I go to an adult prison because I was category A, so I couldn't be kept with young offenders. When I was there, I was looking at 16 years in prison. I got a plea bargain and then I get five years. And I got transferred to a young offenders institution. Then when I come got there, this is where my journey of training started. I got moved there, I was there for one night, the prison officers come to me and they tried to take my clothes off me to put me in an escapist uniform because I come from an adult prison and I refused to give them my, my clothes. I can't begin to tell you, and it makes again men so sad, the hatred I had in my body towards the system. And prison officers, police, politicians, what it represented. I was brought up to detest these people, and when I was in prison it was very real. They took my clothes off me, and they put me in a segregation cell, and I was in there for seven days. At the end of the seven days, they said to me, I'm going to go back up in the wing, and I'm going to be a wing cleaner. I refused. I said, there's no way I'm going up in the wing, and I'll clean up your crap every day. They put me back in that cell. When I was in that segregation cell for the next seven days, I used to avidly read books in prison. Um, and the library used to come around with trolley in the segregation unit. I'd take a book off and I'd read a book every single week. And I read a book Nelson Mandela wrote when he was in Robin Island. And he smoked tobacco. And he realised one day that the prison officers was using the fact that he smoked tobacco as a punishment that they was taking off him. So I thought to myself, if you think by locking me in this cell that you're going to punish me, I will take it away from you. I never left that room for 365 days once. I didn't use the phone, I didn't take exercise, I was locked up in there for 24 hours a day and that was where my journey in exercise and training began. I started doing these cell circuits and I was grossly unfit, I was one of the worst athletes in my school, but I would do these cell circuits and I would do press-ups, burpees, step-ups, press-ups, burpees, step-ups, so as the months progressed, 
I built up and I'd do a thousand of each exercise. I get released from prison, 21 years old, I was a hundred times worse than before I went in there. I come out, carried on committing crime, I was even worse. I get arrested again when I'm 24 years old, for conspiracy to commit armed robbery, a Woolwich Crown Court, I'm a double category A prisoner. There was only 23 prisons in the country with that high level of security. I was locked up for 23 hours a day in a high security unit in Belmarsh Prison. Again, going through the process of training. I go to court, I've got two life sentences with a minimum tariff of serving five years because the judge believed my chances of being rehabilitated were so remote because of my links to serious and organised crime that my rehabilitation was so sort of remote that I would never change. And I wouldn't, and I didn't want to. Because to me, I was brought up to believe that if you changed, you was weak. I, I grew up around men that were alpha males and it was all about what you look like, your name, your reputation. And when you go to prison, anyone that changed was deemed to be a weak person. So I knew I couldn't escape because they made that impossible. I get transferred out of the maximum security unit and I get moved to another maximum security prison and then I manipulate the system to work for the system. And I do, it's working. And on the 14th of November 2009, my life changed forever. I took a phone call one night when I was in prison and my cousin said to me that my best friend that I grew up with since we were little kids had died committing an armed robbery in the Netherlands. And for the first time in my life, I'd ever lost anyone that I cared about enough. And I remember sitting in that prison cell and I looked at myself and from that little eight year old boy that went to be successful and achieved something of his life, all I'd done with my life was waste it. It was like someone had switched on a tap and my life was draining and literally going down into a drain and I was doing nothing. I wasn't winning and I was losing on a scale so big it was unbelievable. And all I had to show from the misery I caused in my life was a £16,000 £16, Rolex watch sitting in a prison cell. And I made a decision that night that I would change my life. But I was completely lost because I gave my life. I gave up my education. I didn't know what I wanted to do in my life. Like, I was completely lost. And the next thing that happened, I went down that prison gym and I got on a rowing machine at 26 years old. And when I sat on that rowing machine every day, I would look at that little monitor and I rode 20 miles a day, and everyone in prison left me alone. Prisoners left me alone, and I didn't want to be around them anymore. And I often say, I was at a point in my life where I wanted to change, but it's like being a drug addict locked in a crack den, and I was still locked in prison, and I couldn't get away from these people. But when I was on that round machine, people left me alone. So I rode a million metres in a month, and then the next month, I rode another million, and the next month, I rode another million. And then someone said to me, you rode five million metres, that's equivalent to running across the Atlantic Ocean. What happened next? I woke up an ability in my body that I did not even know I possessed. I had no interest in sport whatsoever as a child. I was overweight. I had no interest in sportsmen. I could have told you who every single mafia godfather was in America, and I could not have told you who one Olympic rower was. The prison officer looked over my shoulder one day, Darren Davis, and he said to me, my God, that is fast. And I rode 10,000 kilometers in 32 minutes. And he went away and he came back and he gave me all these pieces of paper and had all these well British records on it. And I looked and I said, could I try to do some of them now? And he said, yes. He went away, he got clearance. I went on a journey. The first record I broke was for the marathon. I broke it by seven minutes. When I broke that record, everything I'd ever wanted as a little boy to be successful and achieve something in my life, I realised at that moment I could do it through my body and I didn't have to get it and find that through money. I made a decision to be an athlete. And I went down that prison library and I read, read every book you can imagine on Olympians, on sports nutrition. And what I noticed, when I was reading all these books, all the characteristics that I'd always possessed as a little boy, the drive, the will to win, the want to be successful, the want to achieve anything, all these people that I saw those attributes were criminals. When I was reading these books on these Olympians, and in fact the man's in the room today, James Pratmore, I read his autobiography when I was in prison when he ran across the Atlantic. And I said the characteristics that I possessed were similar to that. I went on within 16 months, I set three world records and eight British records on indoor round machine. My dream at that point was to be an athlete, a professional athlete when I got released from prison. I come out in 2012 after the Olympics, I joined London Rowing Club, which was at that time was a high performance rowing centre, which is it's not now. Um, but I googled it, I saw that it sort of a feeder system into the GB setup. What I didn't realise with rowing, it was very technical. I just thought if I was stronger on the ground machine, stronger lifting weights, I'd be quicker than people. And I soon come to the realisation that I couldn't get to the level I wanted to in the sport of rowing. And my dream was to be a pro athlete, so I ended up doing the sport of Ironman. And that's where I've been today. I've been training every single day for the last three and a half years to be the best athlete I can be. But one thing, and me and Kerry were at Sports Age yesterday, and I just want to say to you, Phil, last year I come to your budget event, 
And I sat on the table with Laura from Sports Aid, and it was down to her. Like, I met her, and she, she welcomed me into the Sports Aid charity, and, and it was the most amazing thing that me and Kerry did just say, helping the next generation of young athletes get to reach their potential in life. I thought when I was a little boy that my legacy would be how many billions and millions of pounds I had in the bank, and then I thought it would be how many medals that I won, how quick I was at Ironman, but what I've come to realise is legacy is actually about helping other people. And I am absolutely driven every single day of my life. I get up every morning at half past five and train. And that is to demonstrate to those young people I talk to that you can make the impossible possible. I stand here today as the only Nike sponsored Ironman athlete on the planet. And I want to show those children the most disengaged kids, which I'm very fortunate I can connect to because they can relate to my story that show them that they don't need to follow the path of chasing money, fast cars, that there's things in life that can be successful other things in life, and I want to demonstrate that that's possible. And just on the final note, because I know I'm like, just over run by, by 60 on. seconds. Carry on, no one's going to stop you. Just everyone in the room that's involved with British rowing, and every single person I've ever come across, Robert Cambridge University, Steve O'Connor from Reach, Anna Marie, everyone that's in this room, the sport has literally given me so much. Like, to set up my own trust and foundation and have Catherine in board and Heather standing and Mark Punter, like, it's given me so much and it's welcomed me and I will never, I will never be able to thank people in the sport of rowing so much, how much they've welcomed my story and they've supported me from the very beginning when there wasn't all the razzmatazz that there is at the moment. But I want to thank you all, I know that as personally as I can today, so thank you so much for listening to me um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you.